Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Katie Weaver. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. The Cambodian government has rejected a demand from a major opposition party to release its leader from detention. Prime Minister Hun Sen said Monday that Kem Sokha, leader of Cambodia's National Rescue Party, will remain detained for now. Kem Sokha has spent more than 18 months in detention. Party leaders are now demanding his release, noting that Cambodian law bans pre-trial detentions lasting more than 18 months. The opposition leader was arrested in September 2017. He is accused of attempting to overthrow the government. But he has yet to be tried. Cambodia's Supreme Court has banned the National Rescue Party. Those actions helped clear the way for Hun Sen's ruling Cambodia People's Party to win all 125 seats in Parliament during the July 2018 elections. After more than a year in prison, Kem Sokha was released on bail but put under court supervision, which is similar to house arrest. He is not permitted to leave the area immediately around his home. He is barred from speaking to other opposition members, including his daughters, as well as any foreigners. Cambodian officials have argued that Kem Sokha can remain in detention because he is technically still on bail and awaiting trial. On Sunday, the National Rescue Party repeated its call for the government to immediately and unconditionally release Kem Sokha. In a statement, the party called his continued detention a conspicuous violation of the nation's constitution. It said the charges against him and his detention are completely driven by politics. Kem Sokha is the symbol of positive change and nonviolent struggle for freedom, respect for human rights, and democracy in Cambodia, the statement said. But Hun Sen and his cabinet reject the calls to free Kem Sokha. A cabinet spokesman told VOA the opposition leader's case must work its way through the courts without government influence. The National Rescue Party also called on the international community to take measures against Hun Sen's government to press for full democracy and human rights. Last week, United States lawmakers proposed a bill that would require the U.S. government to examine Cambodia's preferential trade standing. The bill calls for the government to decide whether the trade treatment should be withdrawn, suspended, or limited. The move came a few weeks after the European Union launched efforts to consider changes to Cambodia's preferential trade treatment with its members. I'm Brian Lynn.
A new exhibit at a California museum provides visitors with a modern version of the ancient Chinese art style, Shan Shui Hua. The name means mountain water painting in English. The show is at the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles. It is called Lightscapes, Re-Envisioning the Shan Shui Hua. The works show scenes of mountains, rivers, and sometimes waterfalls. Chinese artists have been creating the brush and ink works for more than 1,000 years. Artists Nick Dong and Ji Chang Wu found ways to connect the new digital generation to this traditional kind of art. Their work captures the essence of the style in a new way. The exhibit forces the viewer to slow down and experience a different world. That was also one of the goals of Shan Shui Hua artists from long ago. Dong, who was born in Taiwan and now lives in Northern California, said, Actually, it was for all these artists to create a world which they want to hide, avoid, escape from reality. So they create a mountain, imagine they could live there. Song and Wu are trained in both Chinese and Western art styles. They use experimental materials and light in their artworks included in the exhibit. One work involves a slowly moving light directed at clear plastic boxes on a wall. The piece, created by Wu, is called Crystal City. Wu said, if we see this through the light, through the different perspective, we could see there's another world behind that. That other world, Wu noted, are shadows that look more solid than the plastic boxes. Wu said Crystal City is representative of the modern digital age. We spend most of our time in our daily life, no matter to work or to our social life or our entertainment, all on this cyberspace, he said. That space is an escape for many people, similar to the Shan Shui Hua paintings. Dong and Wu's art also employs magnets to raise and lower objects. The movement is meant to show that there is a force between all natural elements. One art piece in the exhibit explores the individual's relationship with the universe. To view Dong's representation of heaven, one has to step into a room filled with mirrors from floor to ceiling. There is a small round seat in the middle of the room. Dong said, We're all searching. We're all longing for growth, become better, and ultimately good enough to go to heaven. He added, Once you've entered the installation, at first you'll see a lot of your reflection. But once you sit down, you trigger the mechanism of the room. The mirror actually starts to reflect and you yourself will disappear within the space. The art pieces in the exhibit are ways in which both artists hope the modern day viewer will be able to experience what the ancient artists were trying to communicate. Lightscapes, re-envisioning the Shan Shui Hua will remain open until November. I'm Katie Weaver.
In 1968, families of students attending Los Angeles County Public Schools took legal action against the state of California. They argued that the state's school funding system, which depended mostly on local property taxes, was unfair to students from low-earning communities. The California Supreme Court agreed, finding that the system violated the students' rights. In its 1971 ruling, it demanded that the state legislature create a new method for funding schools that would deal with the large differences in wealth across district borders. The case became known as Serrano v. Priest. It was considered a major step in improving education in urban areas and closing funding differences in districts across America. Fifty years later, however, a new report says the country still has a long way to go. The nonprofit research group EdBuild found that nationwide, school districts whose students are mostly white receive $23 billion more than school districts that are majority non-white. The report named California, as well as New York and New Jersey, as one of the states with the greatest funding differences between white and non-white students. EdBuild researchers examined financial data from the 2015-2016 school year. They looked at money that went to public school districts where at least three out of four students are white. They compared that to money spent on districts where at least three out of four students are non-white. The two kinds of districts serve almost the same number of students, Edbuild notes. About 12.8 million children attend schools in majority non-white districts, and 12.5 million in majority white districts. When broken down, that means majority non-white school districts receive $2,226 less per student than majority white districts. In California, that number was about $2,390 less per student. And in New Jersey, the difference was even higher, $3,446. Last year, Latino rights groups and others took legal action against the state. They argued that some New Jersey laws and policies block a high number of Black and Latino students from receiving a thorough and efficient education. Their case was filed on the 64th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision known as Brown v. Board of Education which ruled that separating children in public schools based on race was unconstitutional. Public schools educate 90% of America's K-12 students. The public school a student can attend is mostly decided by where their family lives. Public school districts get money from both state and local governments. The funding methods differ by state. Many school districts depend heavily on money from local property taxes. In fact, the majority of children in America are served by school districts funded in this way. Some districts also get funds from state-operated competitive games of chance, like the lottery. Others receive money raised from local sales taxes and other methods. Local governments have the power to decide school district borders. This local control, Ed Build researchers say, works well for some but not for others. They write that 
wealthy communities can use existing laws and political power to draw borders around themselves, keeping deep pockets of money in while leaving less privileged children out. Education experts, including Edbuild chief Elizabeth Sibilia, describe the process as gerrymandering, the dividing of a state or school district in a way that gives one group an unfair advantage. Sibilia said in a statement, so long as we link opportunity to gerrymandered borders and school funding to local wealth, we will never have a fair education system. Sibilia added that her group's findings make it hard to deny that America is investing billions more in the futures of white children. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The Civil War ended in 1865. After that, tensions grew between Congress and the new president, Andrew Johnson. The Republican Party was still new. It was formed to oppose slavery. Radical members of the party controlled Congress. They wanted strong policies to punish the southern states that left the Union and lost the war. Standing in the way of the Republicans was Andrew Johnson, a Democrat. The president opposed radical efforts to force solutions on the South. He vetoed a number of programs that he thought interfered with rights given to the states by the Constitution. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe continue the story of President Andrew Johnson. In the congressional elections of 1866, radicals won firm control of both houses of Congress they were able to pass a number of bills over the president's veto. But Johnson refused to stand aside in the face of radical attempts to seize all powers of government. This conflict between Johnson and the Congress caused much bitterness. Finally, the radicals decided to get him out of the way. For the first time in American history, Congress would try to remove the president from office. Under the United States Constitution, the House of Representatives has the power to bring charges against the president. The Senate acts as the jury to decide if the president is guilty of the charges. The Chief Justice of the United States serves as judge. If two-thirds of the senators find the president guilty, he can be removed from office. Radicals in the House of Representatives brought 11 charges against President Johnson. Most of the charges were based on Johnson's removal from office of his Secretary of War. Radicals charged that this violated a new law. The law said the President could not remove a cabinet officer without approval by the Senate. Johnson refused to recognize the law. He said it was not constitutional. Radicals in the House of Representatives also charged Johnson with criticizing Congress. They said his statements dishonored Congress and the presidency. 
The great impeachment trial began on March 5, 1868. The president refused to attend, but his lawyers were there to defend him. One by one, the senators swore an oath to be just. They promised to make a fair and honest decision on the guilt or innocence of Andrew Johnson. A congressman from Massachusetts opened the case for the radicals. He told the senators not to think of themselves as members of any court. He said the Senate was a political body that was being asked to settle a political question. Was Johnson the right man for the White House? He said it was clear that Johnson wanted to overthrow Congress. Other radical Republicans then joined him in condemning Johnson. They made many charges, but they offered little evidence to support the charges. Johnson's lawyers called for facts instead of emotion. They said the Constitution required the radicals to prove that the president had committed serious crimes. Andrew Johnson had committed no crime, they said. This was purely a political trial. They warned of serious damage to the American form of government if the president was removed for political reasons. No future president would be safe, they said, if opposed by a majority of the House and two-thirds of the Senate. The trial went on day after day. The decision would be close. Fifty-four senators would be voting. Thirty-six votes of guilty were needed to remove the president from office. It soon became clear that the radicals had 35 of these votes. Only seven senators remained undecided. If one of the seven voted guilty, Johnson would be removed. Radicals put great pressure on the seven men. They tried to buy their votes. Party leaders threatened them. Supporters in the senator's home states were told to write hundreds of letters demanding that Johnson be found guilty. A senator from Maine was one who felt the pressure, but he refused to let it force him to do what others wished. He answered one letter this way, Sir, I wish you and all my other friends to know that I, not they, am sitting in judgment upon the President. I, not they, have sworn to do impartial justice. I, not they, am responsible to God and man for my action and its results. A senator from Kansas was another who refused to let pressure decide his vote. He said, I trust that I shall have the courage to vote as I judge best. In the final days before the vote, six of the seven remaining Republican senators let it be known that they would vote not guilty. But the senator from Kansas still refused to say what his vote would be. His was the only vote still in question. His vote would decide the issue. Now the pressure on him increased. His brother was offered $20,000 for information about how the senator would vote. Everywhere he turned, he found someone demanding 
that he vote guilty. The vote took place on May 16th. Every seat in the big Senate room was filled. The Chief Justice began to call on the senators. One by one, they answered, guilty or not guilty. Finally, he called the name of the senator from Kansas. The senator stood up. He looked about him. Every voice was still. Every eye was upon him. It was like looking down into an open grave, he said later. Friendship, position, wealth, everything that makes life desirable to an ambitious man were about to be swept away by my answer. He spoke softly. Many could not hear him. The chief justice asked him to repeat his vote. This time, the answer was clearly heard across the room. Not guilty. The trial was all but done. Remaining senators voted as expected. The chief justice announced the result. On the first charge, 35 senators voted that President Johnson was guilty. 19 voted that he was not guilty. The radicals had failed by one vote. When the Senate voted on the other charges, the result was the same. The radicals could not get the two-thirds majority they needed. President Johnson was declared not guilty. Radical leaders and newspapers bitterly denounced the small group of Republican senators who refused to vote guilty. They called them traitors. Friends and supporters condemned them. None was re-elected to the Senate or to any other government office. It was a heavy price to pay. And yet they were sure they had done the right thing. The senator from Kansas told his wife, The millions of men cursing me today will bless me tomorrow for having saved the country from the greatest threat it ever faced. He was right. The trial of Andrew Johnson was an important turning point in the making of the American nation. His removal from office would have established the idea that the president could serve only with the approval of Congress. The president would have become, in effect, a prime minister. He would have to depend on the support of Congress to remain in office. Johnson's victory kept alive the idea of an independent presidency. However, the vote did not end the conflict between Congress and the White House over the future of the South. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.